Move, move, move. Oh, this is one strong animal. The thing I don't want to have happen is this horn to come up and hit me straight in the face. Okay, so right now the convoy is headed out to the area where the rhino crash has been spotted. There's one specific male that we are targeting this morning with a very large horn. For well over a century, humans have been decimating populations of our planet's animals. Many for reasons that make absolutely no sense. The rhinoceros is arguably the most recognizable species for this global atrocity. To date, nearly 95% of the world's rhino population has vanished. And most of it is due to one single thing. This is the fight to save a species, and our journey to the front lines of battle begins at the Karika Game Reserve. I first learned of Karika in March 2012, just after a dark shadow cast upon the reserve and left them to face an unimaginable crisis. Three of the rhinos were tranquilized by poachers, brutally stripped of their horns, and left for dead. One animal lost its life immediately. The second passed within days, its injuries too much to endure. But the last, a female known as Tandi, miraculously survived due to the Herculean efforts of this man, Dr. William Folds. Looking after these animals is a, a massive collaborative effort. No single reserve can do this alone. And we do rely enormously on the support of people around the world. Getting this message out is critically important. In many large animal procedures, helicopters have proven to be a useful tool as they allow veterinarians to cover a considerable amount of distance in a very short period of time. White rhinos often graze across open savanna, clustered together in a family unit commonly known as a crash. And based on human intentions, this social behavior has its pros and its cons. The positive is that rhinos are big, making them rather simple to locate from an aerial perspective. While the negative is that when they are crashed together, they become an easier target for poachers. Now we're moving from the thicket area into this grassland space. And this is where I would expect to find white rhinos. So we're just scanning the area to see if we can find the right one. Our mission centers around a specific male whose horns have grown to a length that makes him such a target. So in order to give his facial ornaments less black market appeal, it's been decided, and the permits granted, for us to give him a little trim. We got eyes on the target animal. With our bull on the run, and now clearly in sight, Dr. Folds aligns his shot. Okay, tell me when you're good, Alex. Yeah, I'm good. It will be several minutes before the tranquilizer serum takes full effect, giving us a narrow but necessary window to land the chopper and move in as a ground unit. All right, so we got ourselves into a little bit of a tricky position here okay. because he's got his head in a bush, which we're gonna have to clear up now. A rhino procedure is best described as carefully coordinated chaos. He's listening to his breathing, which is nice and deep, so that's good. <laughs> but at the same time, it's a master class of veterinary medicine. Here's how it goes down. The chainsaw masters take over, and in a matter of minutes, they intricately landscape the dense, thorny foliage. Right now, it's important for me to just be as out of the way as I can be. Chainsaw's going, they're taking down all these branches. We gotta make space around the animal before we can get in and do the procedure. Next, Dr. Folds administered a muscle relaxant, which helps to calm heart rate and lower the rhino's intense rush of adrenaline. So it's all about keeping him relaxed and those muscles untense from all the running, obviously he's fired up, right? Yeah. So we need good relaxed muscles that improves blood circulation, gets the lactic acid out of there. And while he's shaking like this, he's burning up oxygen. Shadowing the vet team, I follow precise, organized directives as we collect biometrics, inject a multivitamin, 
and replace the batteries on this big guy's ankle-oriented tracking collar. Listen to the power of the breathing. <sighs> Exchanging breath with a white rhino. Such a beautiful animal, you don't realize truly how big they are until you're literally right next to them. Look at the size of this animal's head. Finally, it's time for the most important order of business, dehorning. Do I have uh, two seconds at this point to talk about the horn a little bit? Sure. So, here's what's gonna happen. Today we are performing a dehorning procedure. There's a couple very important things that you need to know. This horn is not ivory, this is keratin. Just like the same material your fingernails and your hair are made out of. If you look close at this horn, you can see all of these fibrous. Let him go, pull him left, yeah, can't pull hard. It's gonna be a bit wobbly. What this means is we've got our anesthetic dose a little bit wrong and not too serious because we're getting circulation back in his legs. We're just going to walk him towards the trailer because that's where he needs to end up. Well, nothing will make your heart race like a rhino getting up mid-procedure. This is one strong animal, even when it's in this state. You can only imagine how powerful this animal is at full throttle. He should get on any minute now. The thing I don't want to have happen is this horn to come up and hit me straight in the face. Okay, just. Don't support him if he falls over by himself. It's nice and soft here, he can't damage himself. Okay, great, perfect. We're just gonna give him a chance to settle down. That was crazy. Okay, we have successfully moved the rhino out into a more open area, which is perfect for this next aspect of the procedure, which is horn removal. Now, I wanna be very clear about a couple of things. This is what poachers are after, this giant piece of horn. And the problem is that poachers don't come in and just saw off the piece that doesn't touch the root. They come in and they cut it out all the way down to the root. So that goes down and into the snout, causes massive bleeding, it's catastrophic damage that in almost every instance kills the rhino. So as much as I hate to take away a piece of this beautiful animal, the true thing that defines it, this is how you save a rhino. And I cannot stress enough that this has not hurt the rhino, not physically in any way whatsoever. Nice and cool. Okay, let's do back horn. This is the, the procedure that we dread doing the most on Rana. It's yeah. just an absolute sacrilege to take these off. So do you think that this throws off the rhino's depth perception at all by not having the horns in front? I don't think so, but I, I, they know that they don't have a horn. Well, yeah. I mean, they obviously have to learn that when they wake up from all of this. We're going to walk him now. Okay. So we're just going to rock him onto his other side. If he stands up in the process, then great. One, two, three, push, push. Just keep nice. supporting him, that leg's gonna be a little bit floppy. Here he comes, and then we're, here he gonna comes. Go, we're gonna go left. He's in first gear, we're gonna change to second. Keep pulling, we're gonna line him up with the trailer. With the dehorning complete, our final task is to load this bull into a trailer, and relocate him to another part of the reserve. That was unbelievably exhausting. Just the force that it takes to balance that animal. Dr. Fold said probably about one and a half tons, and that's not a full grown rhino. So what we're looking for in transit there is that he's got complete control of his body. We obviously don't want him to be fighting this crate, but he must be able to move himself around and keep himself on his feet without being thrown around by the movement of the vehicle. This new expansive habitat is home to several first-generation cows, and it will only be a matter of time before he claims this territory, breeds, and diversifies the genetic population. What an animal, eh? Unbelievable. Hey, amazing. To think he's still got growing to do too. He's not even fully grown yet. Uh, incredible things. The charge of emotion right now is almost hard to explain. And as I prepared for today's scene, last night I was laying in bed thinking to myself, there are a number of emotions that run through me. Sadness, first and foremost. I can't tell you how sorry I am that we had to take the horn 
from that beautiful animal. Yesterday we were filming B-roll with it in the wild. I mean, I looked right into this animal's eyes, thinking to myself, I'm pretty sure that's the one whose horn we're gonna take tomorrow. So I had to carry that with me going to sleep last night. So that's where the sorrow comes in. Sorry that we as humans have put our planet in a state where we're now being forced to take the prized element that defines a rhino away from it, a dominant male. This is everything that makes up his emotion, his spirit, his confidence. And within that animal's soul and body, he's gonna wake up and wonder, where did my horn go? It makes me angry to know that we as humans are doing something like this to our planet, doing something like this to our animals. And the reason these animals are being poached is because people in other countries, in Asian countries specifically, believe that the rhino horn has medicinal purposes. I can tell you with 100% certainty, it has been proven by doctors that that is absolutely false. Another thing is that wealthy people would love to have this on their mantle, but I can tell you this much, there is absolutely no honor in having the horn of a rhino on your mantle. And for as angry as I can be at the process that poachers go through, you have to understand that in many instances, the poachers themselves are almost forced into these situations. This horn is worth money. If they get this horn and sell that horn, that money provides for their family. It is a vicious cycle. So the sorrow and the anger build together and I realized to myself, you can't fight this fight by being angry. You fight this fight with having hope. Dehorning white rhinos is necessary because of the way that they move in herds. Uh, the next animal we're going to look at is the black rhino, a slightly more solitary animal. And what we're gonna try with this next segment is to find out whether or not technology can be the answer to the future of these animals and not taking its horn, but providing something that may be the front lines of conservation. This horn will be immediately taken off site to a secure, undisclosed location. And I want to note that dehorning is only one aspect of multi-dimensional wildlife protection at Karika Game Reserve. There are around 20,000 white rhinos left in the wild, which classifies these gregarious giants as near threatened. Yet they are not the only rhinoceros in Africa. The black rhino, a more elusive species, is listed as critically endangered, and its wild numbers have dwindled to barely 5,000. Visually, there are a few noticeable differences between the two. For starters, black rhinos are smaller in weight and stature as compared to whites. Taking a closer look at their heads, you will notice that white rhinos have pointed ears and a square upper lip, whereas blacks have rounded ears and a pointed, prehensile upper lip. At ground level, these key features make identifying Africa's rhinos quite simple. But from a helicopter, it's all about experience. So this is typical territory for black rhino. To find a rhino in here is incredibly difficult. We can fly for hours here and not find one. Dense Albany thickets blanket the hillsides, creating ideal foraging and hiding habitat for black rhinos. But for Dr. Folds and the helicopter team, seeking and successfully darting our target animal is a noticeable challenge. Coyote, Coyote, come in for Mike. Go for Mike. Eyes on the radar, we gotta move out. The good thing is that the hillsides aren't too steep, but we might end up on the side of a cliff doing this procedure, so things are about to get intense. So we've identified the right animal. Just gonna load a dart here quickly. Now what Alex is gonna do is just line up this rhino. When she's comfortable, she'll tell me when uh, okay. I can take the shot. Okay, ready? We are good. Good. All right, Rhino's been darted. Nice. This is all open, flat area right here. Okay, got animal down right here. This is typical black rhino. He's got himself with a head in a bush. I'm just going to put his. Blindfold on, make sure we protect his eyes. All in all, black rhino veterinary workups are very similar to our previous white rhino experience. Carefully coordinated chaos. One, three. two, three. Okay. The biggest difference is that instead of taking this animal's defining feature, we will be performing an interhornal implant procedure that disguises a GPS tracking system into the rhino's rear horn. And you can notice how much larger 
the horn is on this rhino because it's never been trimmed before. Using a Dremel, we carefully carve a cavity, which provides a snug fit for the GPS. Oh, it's amazing to hear it breathing. This is what we're fighting to protect right now. And the toe structure is quite a bit different between black rhinos and white rhinos. You see these three large hooves up front, how agile these animals are. Being able to move around on these steep hillsides, a lot of cushioning in the foot, so these toes can almost grip around rocks. For such a large animal, it's amazing how agile they are. Next, a strategically colored dental epoxy is used to fuse the unit in place, keeping it camouflaged and out of the battle zone if this rhino ever squares off with another male. Right, you can see how non-invasive this device is on the animal. Now, once that epoxy is cured, we will grind it down slightly to blend right into the horn, put in the reversal serum, this animal will be good to go. All right, let's go, guys. Remember, the wake-ups are different, so we need to get out of here. Okay. All the way. All right, the uh, transmitter is officially locked in place in the horn. That is what you call a successful mission right there. Uh, we put the reversal serum into the animal, and we got the drone up in the air. We'll be able to follow it as it tracks back and off into the wild. Yes, this was incredible. Looks good. He's finding his feet very nicely. His anesthetic was smooth all the way through. Very happy about that. He didn't uh, give us any surprises, which was good for the humans. And uh, I'm actually very impressed with the implant. We managed to get it in there with a lot of space around it. So it's been a good procedure. I am excited to have participated in one of the first interhornal implant procedures that has been performed on this species. And the technology linked to it will help protect this animal and its horns on a daily basis. That's how you do two rhino procedures in two days. The white rhino dehorning, the black rhino with a piece of technology that might change the face of conservation. What an unbelievable experience. After traveling a journey like this, you arrive at the realization that your final destination has somehow become a new perspective of the world. What happened? Where did we go so wrong that as humans, we have put a fictitious value on the horn of an animal that created a black market demand worth more than gold, diamonds, or oil? When are we going to stand up and who is going to break the wheel that drives the game of horns? Brave Wilderness, in collaboration with Global Conservation Force and Karika Game Reserve, have a pioneering vision to help the future of Africa's rhinos. We are building a safe haven in the Eastern Cape that may become a last stronghold for the preservation of these animals if poaching is not brought to an end. What we do now does truly echo in eternity, and I can promise you in less than 10 years, these animals will be extinct in the wild if we do not take action now. This is the truth of the rhino's plight, but you can change their future. Become a warrior and join the fight by clicking the donate button so that together we can prevent the loss of these vanishing giants. Once upon a time, in a faraway land known as Colorado, a beautiful animal roamed the countryside, where day in and day out, it balanced the ecosystem. Traveling in packs, these predators moved with stealth, darting in and out of the shadows as they stalked the seemingly endless herds of deer, elk, and bison. The unbroken wilderness stretched further than the raven could fly, and as alphas took claim over territories of their own, it seemed this way of life would last forever. It was good to be a wolf. Then through a series of unfortunate events, the westward expansion of pioneers, the decimation of native species like buffalo, and the introduction of domestic animals like cattle, life for a wolf changed. All of a sudden, everyone was afraid of the big, bad wolf. Humans quickly decided that wolves were bloodthirsty villainous killers that must be destroyed. And this inaccurate narrative cast a long dark shadow that these animals could not control, could not rewrite, and could not escape. According to Parks and Wildlife, the last gray wolves were eradicated from Colorado in the late 1930s, and have not roamed this wilderness since. Today is a new day, and with our help, that 
is going to change. As a child, I would dream of wolves often, with the vision that I would one day witness a pack running swiftly through a dense forest, on the hunt, and in hot pursuit of their next meal. It's a dream that has yet to come true, and for many years, the Brave Wilderness team and I have been trying to capture a meaningful episode that centers around the plight of these incredible canids. The Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center is located roughly two hours outside of Denver. All of their animals are rescues, and their mission is to educate the public about the ecological importance of wolves, coyotes, and foxes. I'm really excited. This is going to be the first time in my life that I've entered an enclosure with wolves. I'm going to get to meet the wolves at some point, and then the ultimate payoff will be us actually feeding some of the wolves a deer carcass. Several days ago, Darlene and her team acquired a deer that was hit by a car, and we're going to get the chance to place that carcass in an enclosure, enter it, and watch and film these wolves actually do what it is that they do. Wolves eating. This is going to be an epic. Today I will be working with founder and CEO, Darlene Kababel. Early in her life, Darlene was terrified of wolves due to their misrepresentation in popular culture. Are you a good girl? My love for wolves um, started a, a long time ago, actually by rescuing a wolf dog from a shelter uh, that was gonna be euthanized. And when I rescued her, she actually became my inspiration of wanting to be a voice for wolves. This has been a long journey to get to this point here. My heart and soul goes into wanting to be a voice for wolves and um, excited about one day getting them back out into the wild. Through this relationship, Darlene overcame her fears and recognized that her path in life was to not only rescue wolves, but to help others see them in a positive light. My goal is to do the same. I have no fear around wolves. I'm genuinely excited to work with these animals, and I definitely want to make a good first impression. To prepare for this moment, Darlene suggested that I get to know some of the center's other ambassadors. So in the days leading up to my wolf encounter, I was given the chance to work with a pair of red foxes, where I witnessed their clever tactics for outwitting a human. Hi, how are you? Look at this. The same cleverness that would be exemplified by a wolf. That's cool, right? Oh, no. oh. all right, there he goes. He's got my glove. Let's see what happens. No, no, no. Look who got the glove back. Oh, I got it. After that, Darlene introduced me to a coyote. Posturing and tone play a crucial role in deciding an animal's acceptance of humans. And in just a matter of minutes, I was able to earn the coyote's trust. Ah, this is amazing. Amazing. I thought it was going to take so much longer for him to get comfortable. He must know that I'm one of his friendly cousins. This was a huge step for me and demonstrates that even a timid animal felt comfortable in my presence. By successfully interacting with these smaller canids, Darlene is now confident that I am ready to advance to the next level, entering an enclosure with wolves. The gray wolf is considered the largest of the canids. Males can reach 150 pounds, and while they do grow larger than the females, a lady wolf only weighs in at around 90 pounds. My first encounter will be with a wolf known as Orenda. Like all wolves, Arenda is always on high alert, with her senses firing on all cylinders. Front-facing eyes provide an incredible field of vision with highly tuned depth perception. Ears perked, this wolf can hear sound frequencies from many miles away and can detect a multitude of sounds human ears cannot. But Arenda's most powerful tool is her nose which contains roughly 300 million olfactory receptors, making her sense of smell 40 times greater than that of a human. I mention these senses because they immediately allow Renda to tune in with foreign objects, like cameras and bearded strangers, that are about to enter her home. Now, Darlene said I need to take off the majority of my outer clothing. That's so that the wolves don't uh, grab onto my hood. As you can see, this jacket has 
some fur on it, which looks like a great thing for a wolf to grab onto and play with. And they're extremely powerful. The last thing I want to happen is for a wolf to grab me and start dragging me somewhere. So I'm gonna also take off this vest and then I'm gonna put on my wolf warrior in training vest. Now Darlene did also say to take off my hat because the wolves may take it, but it's keeping my head warm right now. So I think we'll just see what happens. And I think at this point, I'm ready to enter into the enclosure and become one of the wolf pack. Here we go, a coyote meeting wolves. All right, Darlene, I'm geared up. I kept the hat on. If they take the hat, I feel like I'll be okay with it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, so through here? Yes, are you ready? Yeah, I think I'm ready. All righty. I'm excited. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna let you in first, then I'm gonna shut the door after you. Okay. It's a double gate system. Okay. Secure. All right, so this is our second gate here. It's a big step down, so be real careful. It's icy out here in January. Okay, so the white one up there, our little Arctic wolf, his name, um, he's a male, is Aisha. Hi, Aisha. And then we have Orinda, and that's okay. over here. All right. And that's the female. There she is. So she Hi. probably likes you to get down on her level there. Okay. As you can see, there's some deer fur that you're sitting in right there. And uh, palm up with her. Oh, she's giving you some kisses. All right. Hi, how are you? How are you? This is amazing. My first face-to-face -face encounter with the wolf. I see your paw, it's so big. Wow, it's amazing being right next to a wolf like this. They're a lot bigger than you would think, especially those paws. I'm just letting her check me out right now. Yeah, I see. Is it okay for me to be in here? Now, what's the best way for me to seem submissive to this wolf? Darling? Always be down on her level. Okay. And when you go to pet them, you want under the chin instead of on top of the head. Okay. Because she can see your hand that way. Okay. Because it can make them nervous if you're going over the top of the head. Good so how, how old is she? Uh, she is two years of age. Okay. So Hi, she's... Sweetie. Pretty much still a pup. Who are you? Those beautiful yellow eyes that she has. But she's pretty much full size right now, correct? Yeah, she is. She has a full winter coat on. Uh, weight on her would probably be around 80 pounds. Okay. 70, 78, 80 pounds. And she is a gray wolf, or also known as timber wolf. Yep. Um, gray wolf and timber wolf, same thing. Just depends on where you live and what you call them. I would say she's the most quintessential look. When you think wolf, yes. she is sort of that perfect color design. And they come in multiple different color phases. There's like this gray mixture, black, white. Is there any other that mix in there as well? Uh, you know, your typical is gonna be what we call a silver gray, like mm -hmm. what you see there. They can be in shades of black, black and sort of a cream. They can have some reddish tones in there, but that is your most typical. When you think of a, a gray wolf or a timber wolf, that's sort of what you think of. Mm -hmm. Orinda! Orinda! So is there a key word or phrase that you use to bring her in closer to you ever? Uh, she likes high-pitched voices. <laughs> and if you say treats really high, she definitely is treat motivated. Okay. So she likes that as well. And she knows I have a couple in my pocket. I see. And uh, so she's checking you out. And she what said, is, oh, there's something else fuzzy there. Oh, she's got there. my hood. No. She's got my hood. <laughs> she, she wants something fuzzy. Want so something I'm going to try to... Yep, That's so what you want to do is... <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that she's not getting behind your neck there because yep. she'll want to steal them. Yep. Oh, she said, I'll give you a kiss. So. No, I did grow out this beard just for you guys. No, none of that. What is, what is she saying with that little growl there? <laughs> she, she's saying that um, she wants doesn't want you to lay down. She wants you to sit up like I that. See. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Maybe she's probably wanting your story. jacket. And so she's saying, I, I want that jacket. Nice. So. <laughs> she could be a little bit nervous because there's a lot of people in here who don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I have meat treats and she's wanting that and not wanting you to take it away from right. her. And, uh, and that, that could is, be... <laughs> that is the full, full wolf kiss <laughs> yes, right it is. there. Yes, it is. And I'm glad that she has good breath and she hasn't ate a roadkill deer. Yes. So I'll uh, bring her over here. See how fast she oh, is. Yeah. Here you go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It makes you nervous to, to feed a wolf That's, pieces of meat. You don't want your finger to end up in there. So as soon as she goes for it, I try to keep my That's hand. That's calling eat like a wolf. Yeah, yeah, eating like a wolf. It's amazing how fast she's. Very fast, and you've got to be very careful with your fingers. Yep. So very fast. There we yeah, go. There we go. That's we go. gone that quick. Yeah, I, like, I, 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 I see what you're doing. We're letting her kind of like dig in like that mm -hmm. a little bit. I'm a little nervous that she'll like grab onto yeah, my thumb. The way thumb she is though. right now, I would probably just do a flat yeah. hand there. and. Um, 
I'm, what I'm trying to do is get her away so you can sort right. of just see how quick she is, and if it falls on the ground, yep. let her let her go. Let her it. pick it up. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely gets your heart racing a little bit as soon as she lunges like that, and you can just see. I mean, the power and the strength and the speed is. It's just incredible. It is. Isn't I can it? imagine what it would be like to see wolves in the wild, a pack of them taking down something like a moose. You think about how big an ungulate like that is mm -hmm. and how they work together as a team to right. bring something down. Just being this close, seeing that power within this proximity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can understand how they're able to move so quickly to throw that animal off right. balance, be able to work together as a team to then take down larger right. prey. Right, absolutely. Good girl. Now, when it comes to the pack structure here within the individual enclosures, I noticed that there's two wolves per enclosure. Mm -hmm. Now, are they both considered alphas within their own little domain? What happens is we try to pair them up, uh, usually in a male-female combination there. I have had up to a six-pack together, but because you've changed all the dynamics in a captive situation, that does change. Whereas out in the wild, they can disperse from a pack. In captivity, that doesn't happen. And so eventually, it keeps dwindling down to where you have two compatible pair. Well, I think we've had the great chance to be up close and personal with a wolf. And now, as I understand it, you guys actually have a roadkill deer <laughs> that we'll be able to bring into one of the enclosures and actually see how wolves eat. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm ready. If you're ready, yes. let's feed some wolves. Let's do that. The wolf is considered to be one of the most intelligent and resilient animals on the planet. So how is it that they are struggling to avoid extinction? The answer is simple, humans. Wolf populations have declined due to no weakness of their own. But instead, these animals have been the victim of ruthless persecution. To date across the world, wolves have been eradicated from almost all of their original range. In the United States alone, they now only occupy 10% of their former range. Over hunting for the fur trade, eradication by ranchers who are protecting their livestock, and deforestation are just a few examples of what have driven wolves toward extinction. So here's what's happening. This is the first time a film crew has ever gone in with a roadkill deer to film wolves. The two wolves whose enclosure we're entering are actually the wildest wolves on the property. So we're trying to make sure we're taking all the proper safety precautions before going through with this exercise. As you can see, we have a mule deer here in this wheelbarrow. The deer was struck by a car, um, and this is great. This is part great enrichment for the wolves. This is completely natural food for them to be eating. But like I said, this is the first time anyone will have entered an enclosure with these wolves to do a filming like this. So we gotta make sure we get everything right. This is gonna be wild. All right, here we go. Ready? Entering into the first gate here. This is it. All right, Darlene, I'll have you open the gate. I'm gonna to need to try to move as quick as I can to get the carcass up on the hillside before the wolves converge in on it. So you have Rockshaw here. He's probably okay. gonna be your one that's gonna take it quicker than her. Okay. Because she's up at the top, so He's one that we'll have to watch out for. So okay. The, the male. Great. Here we go. Pulling a mule deer carcass into an enclosure of wolves. All right, let's go. All right, now go ahead, you follow me. I'm bringing it up. Dinner served, boys and girls. Now what we want to do is just stay a safe distance back and the wolves are coming straight in for the carcass. Here we go. Don't want to make them feel as if they're being challenged at all. Look at that. This wolf is so incredibly powerful. This is a small deer, right? A single wolf can pull a 150 pound deer up a hill like this. Okay, as the wolves begin to pull it, we can slowly follow to get closer. And you can see the male, the alpha male is very much going to be the first one to feed. In the pack mentality, it's always the alphas that are going to be the first one to feast. We have the female, she's the black one, running up in the background there. They're a little cautious at the moment because we have cameras in the enclosure. I see you, big boy. You're good. That's for you. That's for you. Enjoy. That's dinner. That's all you. That's pretty nerve-wracking right there. Okay. 
beautiful. Let's see where the wolf takes the carcass, and then we can set up and determine how we're gonna film this. Okay, I see you. I'm gonna move down slowly like this. Uh, first order of business for a wolf is to start removing that hair. They will eat some of the hair, and it works as fiber through their system to remove any bone particles or parasites within the organs. He says the alpha male, he's taking charge of the situation. The female, she's very skittish right now. She notices that there's other people within the enclosure, but as she gets more comfortable, she'll come down and also start feeding. A pack of wolves makes a kill, whether it's a deer, an elk, or a moose. They need to try to consume the meat as quickly as possible. There are many other vandals that will come in and steal a kill. Wolves in the northernmost range of their territory have to face things like grizzly bears and wolverines. Even something as small as a wolverine will come in and chase an entire pack of wolves off of its kill. So they want to eat as quickly as they possibly can, and they'll rip stuff apart and then take it away and stash it. I see you. That's my gift from me to you. Enjoy that deer. He's just kind of testing the limits right now, right? Walking away, making sure, okay, you're not gonna get any closer, are you? This is my deer. You think you're gonna get closer? I'll show you what a wolf can do to a coyote. So we've backed off even further from the carcass, which has opened up that level of comfort for the female. She's come down now, and she's just eating some of the scraps. Yeah, some interesting little behavior there. Female came in and she was like, I'm gonna start eating. You see, the alpha male is definitely taking control of this situation. By displaying his teeth and snapping, it may look as if Raksha is being overly aggressive towards Chakra, but he's not. He is visually saying, Let me have my fill, you will get your turn. This is common, everyday behavior for wolves. And despite the fact that it looks scary, it really shouldn't be. Wow. I have been witness to some pretty cool animal encounters, but I don't think anything tops getting to feed wolves a mule deer carcass. What if I told you that everything you thought you knew, that everything you feared about wolves, was nothing more than a poorly written narrative constructed over 100 years ago. Think about that. What if the story has been wrong the entire time? Consider this. Of the 100 million cattle raised in the United States every year, do you know how many fall prey to wolves? 0.01%. Do you want to know how many humans have been killed by wolves in the past century? Two. This planet needs wolves more than any of us will ever understand. And most of us will never do a single thing to edit the wrongful narrative that has been written. Are you afraid of the big bad wolf? If so, go and visit the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center. I challenge you to face your fears. And I promise you will walk away with a newfound respect and a feeling in your heart that can only be achieved once you've looked into the eyes of a wolf. As a child, I dreamed of one day encountering wolves in the wild. And it's a dream I hope comes true in Colorado. If you live in this beautifully wild state, please support Bill 107, as this initiative will allow for the reintroduction of wolves into the wild and will put paws on the ground by 2023. We can't rewrite the past, but for the love of wolves, we can change their future. To help us bring wolves back to Colorado, click on the link in the video description below and visit the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. Since launching the Brave Wilderness channel, there have been a slew of comments suggesting that we make a video of me, Coyote Peterson, meeting a real life coyote, as in the animal. Sounds like a no brainer that would be seemingly easy to produce, but truth be told, Getting up close with a coyote is much more difficult than one might think. Approaching coyotes in the wild is virtually impossible. 
as these skittish canids will often flee at the first smell, sound, or sight of humans. So it wasn't until we teamed up with the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center that this fateful meeting finally appeared as if it was going to happen. Renowned for their conservation efforts, specifically centered around wolves, this location is also home to an adorable pair of red foxes. I had some pretty good luck frolicking around with Rhett and Scarlet. We had some cheese, we played on the fox slide, Rhett stood on my head, and even stole my glove, which wasn't exactly easy to get back. I only have one glove, and the odds of me being able to get that glove back are not real good. Uh-oh, uh-oh, you see what's happening? Uh, uh, Rhett, my, oh boy. Rhett has taken my glove up and through the fox Skyway. What we learned was that the foxes trusted me and the cameras in their enclosure. But I know gaining the trust of a coyote will be much more difficult. So to help in making a friendly introduction, I'll be working alongside the Wolf Center's founder and CEO, Darlene. For the past 20 years, she has dedicated her life to rescuing wolves and their cousins, all while educating the public about the importance of having these predators present in their natural environment. Good morning, Darlene. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. I'm excited. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> this is going to be the first time that we actually have the opportunity for me to get face to face with the coyote. Now, just so you understand, it's been five years since we launched the Brave Wilderness Channel and the audience is always saying, Coyote, when are you going to get face to face with the coyote? But we've not had that opportunity until now here at the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center. Now, as I understand it, the coyotes are very skittish though, correct? They are. Yes, they are, um, um, but we'll give it our best shot. Okay, now in getting the coyote to come close, what's gonna be my best approach? What's gonna be the tactic? So we're actually gonna go in there and um, you wanna sort of be natural and, and just sort of maybe talk to him a little bit. His okay. name is Wiley. Okay, Wiley, <laughs> and, that sounds about right. Yes, <laughs> and they like uh, for you to be more on their level. So mm -hmm. standing up is sort of a little bit intimidating to them. And then I've got some power treats, as I call them, to see if we can say, hey, this is an offering. We just wanna say hi to you. All right, you lead the way. Okay. We're filming. All Let's right. go. Let's go. For over a century, coyotes have suffered an unbelievably bad rap, portrayed as vicious killers that pose a threat to mankind. Yet this conviction couldn't be further from the truth. My goal is to demonstrate how timid these animals are, even one that has been practically hand-raised by humans. According to Darlene, I am one of the only outsiders that has ever tried to interact with this coyote, and physical contact by anyone other than Darlene has never been achieved. So it is completely possible that this animal will want nothing to do with me. So, Darlene, what we were thinking is maybe set up in this back snow area here. Back over here, um, okay. Back over here, uh -huh. and I'm gonna try to figure a good spot to place the cameras. Okay. And we will see if the coyote will come down and hang out. What I'm gonna do is set up this camera. He's in here? Oh, he's in here, he's in his little, oh. he's in his little thing there. Oh, Wiley! There he is, that's his castle. It's like Game of Thrones in there. Yes. Hey buddy, I'm gonna take off my sunglasses. There he is, there he is. Hi. Hi, Hi Wiley. There he is, good boy. So that's good his boy, little treats. coyote castle. And what I'm gonna do is set up the cameras over here. It's gonna take some time. I'm gonna have to be very patient. But with any luck, he'll warm up to us uh, and come out and we'll have this moment. Mario and the crew are setting up their cameras on an overlooking observation porch. Their presence in the enclosure will definitely be too intimidating for the coyote. Keeping the technology footprint small is important. So I have a pair of GoPros that shouldn't seem too threatening. I'll set those up next to me with the hope that they will catch any up-close moments with the coyote. If I am simply able to get this animal to investigate my presence, I will consider the encounter an incredible success. Today is Coyote's big day. He's going to meet a real coyote. Myself and Matt were up here. We've got this vantage point. Coyote, the animals, are very skittish. Uh, they're intelligent animals and they've survived for so long because of the fact that they are so skittish and they could actually hide from predators and from humans. They actually are very good at living on the peripheral of urban environments or actually even in urban environments 
but they're seldom seen. They're just super secretive and elusive. So right now, Darlene is trying to coax Wiley out of his little castle. You guys have to remember, the coyotes, they are very smart animals. So anytime there's something different in uh, a coyote's environment, it's going to be very, very skittish. So um, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some patience, but with any luck, I'm going to go face to face with one of my adorable cousins. There he is, good boy. Hi, very nice, good boy. Hi, Wiley. Good boy. Buddy. It's okay. Okay, Wiley is officially out of his castle at this point. Just a few feet from me. Hi, good morning. He's getting there comfortable. He is. Good boy. Good here boy. He comes. He's right here. There he is. We're here to say hi to you. Good boy. Wow. Well, I'm going nice. to actually put a bag of treats into my pocket okay. and see if Wiley will get a little more comfortable with us. See this? Little tiny meat treats. Those are just little pieces of bologna right there. A perfect treat for a coyote. Now he's coming right up to me. There you go, bud. Look at that. There you go. Oh my gosh, you're right there. That's so cool. That's what really good. good. What a good coyote. Hi, bud. It's gonna lay down like this. Wiley, look at treats. Oh. You see that? Oh. He took it right out of my hand. That's really good. That's really good? He doesn't do that for people that he has never met before. Okay. I'm feeling pretty good about this. You need, a, that's that's your relative right there. So. Okay. <laughs> Why are we? This is amazing. Only a few minutes in and already Coyote has eaten out of my hand. Why are we? Here you go, bud. Oh, good boy. Good boy. Look at this. Look, there we go. Very yeah. good. Right. Okay. What a good boy. This is amazing, amazing. I thought it was gonna take so much longer for him to get comfortable. He must know that I'm one of his friendly cousins. Look at the hesitation, that timid pause in the seconds that seem to last forever as this creature slowly lends me its trust. Does this behavior scream bloodthirsty killer to you? I didn't think so. Next to wolves, there isn't a predator on our planet that has been more aggressively driven toward annihilation than the coyote. It hurts my heart that humans choose to destroy before they care to understand. And whether you believe it or not, our planet needs coyotes and the predator versus prey balance they bring to the ecosystem. This is amazing. My first contact with a coyote. I'm so thrilled right now. So we came to Colorado in the winter because we wanted to experience the wolves and coyotes in their best coat. So in the winter they had their big fluffy coats and in order to prepare for this, Coyote actually started to grow out his beard. Actually I did as well. As of right now, Coyote's got his uh, big beard and he's got his big uh, actual coat on that has kind of some uh, fake fur that kind of looks like Coyote. So I think he's trying to not only think like a coyote, but he's trying to actually look like one too. That is awesome. That is me face to face, about as close as you're gonna get with a coyote. Such a beautiful, beautiful creature. That was awesome. Okay, well, Wiley has moved up and into the other enclosure. I don't think it could have gone any better than that. How did oh, I do? My gosh, that was amazing. Simply amazing. You did fantastic. <laughs> Within the first five minutes, getting Wiley to come up and actually take a piece of cheese out of my hands was beyond my expectations. We spent about 20 minutes filming the scene. We thought it may take hours, but I think Wiley realized, hey, I'm a coyote, you're a coyote, we should be buddies. You've got little meat and cheese treats. Let's hang out. <laughs> That's it. I didn't even think that would happen. So you must have some coyote blood in you. <laughs> well, my namesake has come true. I'm officially one with the coyotes. Darlene, I cannot thank you enough for getting me up close with one of these animals. Coyotes continue to be cast as villains, and the overly hyped horror stories that surround them drive a fear into society that in turn creates an unwarranted hatred for the species. Human interactions do occasionally occur. However, these canids are not something we should fear, but instead should have a well-educated awareness of. Coyotes do not consider humans to be prey, but it is fair to say that domestic animals, like cats and smaller dogs, 
do occasionally make enticing targets. If you have an outdoor pet, be cognizant of coyotes in your area. Don't leave them outside and unattended, especially during the hours when these predators are most active. Coyotes have found, and always will find, a way to survive. As humans, our mission should be finding a way to survive alongside these predators, not without them. It's a beautiful sunny morning here in West Virginia, and welcome to Glade Springs. Today's event promises to be painfully entertaining, as self-proclaimed beast of bites, Kyle Peterson, is going to be strategically taken down and, of course, bitten by three truly terrifying, yet professionally trained canines. <gasps> Peterson will be wearing a Kevlar bot suit, and while it will protect him from lacerations and punctures, it does not have padding, and he will feel every bit of pressure in these bites. The playing field measures 60 feet, so once the canines are released off the leash, Peterson will only have seconds to prepare for impact, and running is not an option. Each dog will be ranked on a scale of one through five across three categories. Intimidation, impact, and bite force. I gotta tell you, I've seen some dumb, ridiculous dog shows, but nothing tops the insanity that is the best in bites. Now, before we get eyes on the lineup of pooches, first a big thanks to our Marquee sponsor, McCor Canine of West Virginia. If you are in the market for a tactically trained law enforcement or home security companion, give them a call. Not only do their dogs have the bark, you're about to see that they definitely have the bite. Ooh, first up will be a German shepherd named Messi. Weighing in at around 70 pounds and armed with an estimated bite force of over 220 pounds, it's fair to say that this is not going to be a pretty scene. Peterson's second hit, if he lasts that long, will come in the form of a Doberman pincher named Mushka. Tipping the scales at 95 pounds, his intimidation level should be off the chart and he proudly boasts being a fully trained home security dog. Now, if Peterson is still standing after the first two dogs, his final feet will be going up against a tactically trained Belgian Malinois named Kasia. Woo-hoo-hoo! 75 pounds of pure muscle backed up by a bone-crushing bite force, this dog is designed to enforce a fast surrender. My goodness, okay. Mr. Beast of Bites, no guts, no glory. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Best in Bites. Okay guys, I'm getting ready for the first dog. I've decided to go with the German Shepherd because, I mean, it's intimidating based on its coloration, but it hasn't been snapping, hasn't been snarling yet. Uh, I'd say it's medium size when it comes to its weight. And this is, again, remember, training for the dog. This is actually really fun for these dogs to be doing this. It's almost like playing a game of fetch. The only difference is that I'm the toy at the end of the run. So cameras are rolling. Here we go. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the bite zone with the German Shepherd. Here we go. Hey boy, here I am. Here we go, here we go. Here I am, right here, right here, right here. Ow, 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 ow. Ah, ah, ah. He's getting close to my hand. Surrender, surrender, surrender. Surrender. Ouch. Ouch. Good boy. Ouch. <sighs> wow. Did you see the speed at which Missy covered the field? I gotta say, 
Peterson held up and danced well in the presence of that 220-pound bite force. I would have been crying for mercy before the dog even hit me. Okay, let's head back to the field and get an official tally. Holy bone-crushing bite force. I would say that on a scale of one to five, this being the first dog, that was probably a three. I want to say a three, maybe more. Oh, definitely more powerful than Maya, the Belgian Malinois that we worked with a few years ago. Oh, and I called surrender at one point because my hand started slipping out of the bite jacket and was becoming exposed. What I didn't want to happen was for the dog to take one chomp further and actually get teeth into my flesh. <sighs> Intimidation level, I would say probably a two. Not too much snapping to start off. Impact, probably about a two as well. But the bite, definitely without question, a three. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my heart is racing. Okay, okay, we're good. I'm ready to go to the next dog. Oh. It never gets any easier, guys. It never gets any easier. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to be bitten by the Doberman Pinscher. Here we go. All right, Jay, release the beast. Over here, buddy. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Right here. Oh, the dog's so big, he can get all the way up on top of me. Okay, I surrender, I surrender. I surrender. Ah! Ah! Out! Only a true bonehead would sneak into a yard or a house with that pooch on the prowl. I mean, look at this replay. When it's up on its back legs, I think the dog is taller than Peterson himself. Coyote's still rolling around on the ground. Come on, Mr. Bites, get up. We need an official tail. Oh, man. Oh, I gotta catch my breath. Holy mackerel. Oh, my heart. My heart is going so fast right now, I hardly breathe. Oh, my gosh. When you see a dog of that size barreling straight towards you, when he gets up on his back legs, he's as tall as I am. I was looking his mouth right in my face. As I got my arm up, he got me low on the wrist, which immediately I was like, oh my gosh, he's gonna get my hand. He ended up working up towards my elbow because I turned my arm. I was able to actually stay up on my feet a little easier than I was the German Shepherd, believe it or not. I think that's because of the height of the dog itself. Now, my arm was deep back into those teeth too. The size of that dog's head is absolutely massive. And even through this bite suit, man, I could feel a lot of pressure. Once it really realized what it was biting down onto, those bites increased. I mean, they got more and more powerful as the dog amped itself up. And oh my gosh, by the end of it, when I had to call surrender, it was, it was painful. More painful than the German Shepherd. I would say on a scale of one to five, the bite force, ranks as a four. I would say intimidation factor is without question a four. When it comes to impact, there was intimidation to that. It didn't hit as hard as the German Shepherd did. So I'd say I'm gonna give it only a two on the impact. But man, a dog of that size is not something you ever want to be latched onto your arm. Oh, I need a breather before we go Malinois. Oh, oh my goodness, I am a true human chew toy. Woo! Okay, this is it. Last dog of the day. Without question, the intimidation factor is on the next level. When this dog is on the leash, it is snapping, snarling, spit and slobber. This is a fully trained tactical Belgian Malinois. This is, uh, this is it. This is gonna be the bad one. Oh man. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm Coyote Peterson and I'm about to be bitten by the Belgian Malinois. All right, here we go. Come on, buddy, come get me. God, 
Get him, get him, get him, get him! Ah! 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 I surrender, I surrender, I surrender! Ah! 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 Clear dog, clear dog. Ah. 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 Okay. There is no question about it. The Belgian Malinois bite is next level compared to the German Shepherd and to the Doberman Pinscher. Oh my gosh, that was insanely painful. I can't move my arm right now. Oh my gosh. I mean, the impact, the dog actually slammed into me, threw me backwards, then found me again and latched on. And I mean, we're talking bites up and down my arm. And when he finally got down to a narrow spot by my wrist, where he could get his entire mouth over and locked in place, I mean, just crushing power. I could feel the teeth grinding up against my bone. I can't even explain to you guys how painful that effect is. But remember, the bite suit is preventing the teeth from actually penetrating skin, but I am feeling all of that impact. Intimidation factor, five, impact, four, pressure of bite, Five, no question about it. Oh my gosh, okay, I gotta get the bite suit off and take a look at my arm. Ah, uh, give me a minute. <laughs> I gotta be honest, okay? That dog was like a laser beam off the leash. It had take down burning in his eyes. And I can only imagine what Peterson must have been thinking. I, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he soiled his bite suit. Seriously. Oh man, my arm is sore. The swelling is beginning to set in. Without question, I'm gonna have bruises. And to be honest, it's hard to squeeze my hand into a fist. Now, when you break it all down, the German Shepherd versus the Doberman Pinscher versus the Malinois, without question, the Malinois takes the title in the Best in Bites show. And I wanna give a big thanks to McCore Canine of West Virginia for allowing us to be a part of their training procedures. Remember, while these dogs may look fierce and ferocious, turning me into a human chew toy is all a part of their daily training. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of our show. It was a thrilling journey, and I think we can all walk away with a new appreciation for the talents possessed by these incredible canines. Signing off, I'm your host, Wolf Masterson, saying goodbye and good night. This is the closest we have been to a jaguar yet. This cat's definitely actively hunting. She's very slowly slinking through the water hyacinths and the taller grasses. It's a beautiful morning here in the Brazilian Pantanal. Today we're heading out on the Cuba River. This protected habitat is known for its high concentration of jaguars, one of the world's largest cat species. I'm gonna be working alongside Abby Martin. Now, Abby is the founder and president of the Jaguar ID Project. And over the past decade, she has been cataloging these incredible cats. She's not only giving them names and collecting their stats, but she's creating a genealogy family tree. To this point, she has documented over 300 of these beautiful felines. So with any luck, we are going to see some beautiful cats, get some epic shots, and learn all about the work that Abby's doing. These big cats are the true kings and queens of this Brazilian wilderness. And the moment you catch sight of one, their mystique captures you in a way that never lets go. This is the closest we have been to a jaguar yet. We've got two of them right down at the water drinking. Wow, beautiful. 
Probably never gets old seeing Jaguars, does oh. it? She's getting up. Over the past quarter century, the northern Pantanal specifically has become famous for its high concentration of jaguars. Not too many people know about this place. You know, it's one of the most biodiverse wetlands in the world, but like most people you tell that you're going to the Pantanal, they don't even know about it. But you know, everyone knows about the Amazon and it's the world's lungs, but the Pantanal is kind of like a heart, mm -hmm. it's like a beating heart. Mm -hmm. So it's super important to protect this area. And I think using the jaguar, we can do that together. Once upon a time, cats in this area were heavily hunted for the fur trade. Many others were killed by farmers who saw them as a threat to livestock in what is commonly known as the jaguar cattle conflict. But the good news is that this population is currently flourishing. And now, people travel from all around the world to admire, film, and photograph these cats as local communities recognize that a living jaguar is far more valuable than a dead one. Amazing morning so far. This is our second jaguar sighting, and right now the lighting is really nice. We actually haven't really seen jaguars on the sandbank that often. That's a cool shot right there, coming right up to the water's edge. So the unique markings that I look for on Patricia is this L that kind of frames her eye there. And then on her left, right where, like, about where her heart would be, there's almost a rosette pattern that looks like a heart. So what's super cool is Patricia is Abby's favorite cat. Patricia is the logo for the Jaguar ID project. So this is so cool that we are filming the cat that is literally the symbol of the Jaguar ID project on the day that we're out here filming with Abby. How crazy is that? That was awesome. That was the first time they've ever walked towards the camera. So we got head on shots. You press Our record, movie. right? Oh, oh no, yeah, we did. <laughs> To capture the best cinematography of Jaguars in action, Trent and Maria spent months building, testing, and ultimately rigging a camera and gimbal system that was designed specifically to the specs of this boat. These will be our beauty shots. Patricia is very slowly slinking through the water hyacinths and the taller grasses. Abby said she's in hunting mode, and the way you can tell is their shoulders become hunched and they stick closer to the ground, just like you might see your own cat doing as it stalks, you know, a little laser pointer in your family room. This is a much different scenario, though. This cat's looking for Cayman. Our boat driver is saying that she wants to cross the river. Uh, the boats have given her enough space now. Hopefully she's going to make it all the way across. These cats are incredible swimmers. The Jaguar is the most aquatic oriented big cat on the planet. The speed at which she can move across the river is, it's crazy. This cat is just zooming. The jaguars know these waters like the back of their paw. But as humans, to help us navigate the complex maze of rivers, we hired the top adventure outfitter, biodiverse Brazil tours, and their superstar boat captain. This cat's definitely actively hunting. She's entered the reeds now, which is, you know, where the caimans hide. So, we'll see what happens in the next few minutes. She's coming right into view. We find ourselves fixed right in the middle of a full-on jaguar hunt. That was an attempt right there, that was awesome. <gasps> Jaguars are considered super apex predators. And aside from their grappling retractable claws, their primary weapons of choice are kept hidden within their skull. Robust and relatively short by design, it is densely packed with muscle, providing them one of the strongest bite forces of any cat species. But their teeth, those will send chills down your spine 
right before they snap it. Specifically designed for penetrating the thick hide and scales of prey items like caiman, just a single bite is powerful enough to crush the back of a skull or sever the spinal column, rendering their victim completely helpless. When it comes to being an effective killer, nothing in the mammalian kingdom is more lethal than a jaguar. Now, one way that we're able to keep an eye on the cat without physically seeing her is just watching the movement of the grasses, which are much taller than she is, and also the flight of birds, because the birds are the first alarm sign that a cat is in the area. Okay, so the jaguar has decided to forge the river. It is swimming from one embankment to the other. It's a very wide stretch. We're just giving her lots of space so we don't spook her. And she's gonna try to hunt this other shoreline where hopefully there will be some better options for food. So close, my heart's racing. Oh. <laughs> Abby, how did she miss that one? Uh, you saw how she kind of like was trying to grab with her hands. Yeah. Sometimes they get a hold and then she get a hold with her mouth. And yeah. You start rolling in the water, but it's escaped again. Ah, uh, what a close call. So Abby, we're getting into another cat's territory, Estella's, who we saw last night. Will she hunt in Estella's territory? Yeah, yeah, she'll, she'll continue to hunt here. If Estella feels like she's gonna get too close to her kill, there could be a cat fight. Wait a second, Estella caught a caiman last night? <sighs> yes, she did. And wouldn't you know it, we just missed it. We had been watching her sleep for several hours, but chose to go down river to film a couple drone shots since she didn't seem very active. Then all of a sudden, a call came over the radio waves and boats began rushing to the area where we left Estella. And as we arrived, the last thing we saw was her pulling a caiman up the embankment and out of sight. Ah, talk about frustrating. We missed a hunting behavior. We missed a jaguar catching a caiman. We, had, we, we had the opportunity for the shot. We had it. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. We gotta move on and we'll find a way to get the shot and that's the nature of what it is. I imagine that these two have already encountered before, like their territories overlap. Um, but when food's involved, it's a different story, you know, so. We'll see what happens. Well, we lost the cat. Patricia disappeared up over a hill and deeper into the jungle, and we have not seen her for about 20 minutes now. The good news is that all of the boats are gone. We are the only boat out here now, and we got the closest we have been to filming a jaguar catching a caiman. She literally had her paw on the front of the reptile, but unfortunately it thrashed, got away, and she remains hungry, just as we remain hungry for capturing this amazing shot. We are all so busy trying to fight for the life that we want, that most of us never take the time to slow down and appreciate the very moment we are living in. The jaguar lives and dies by its daily moments. There are no opinions, no influences, no regrets for being anything other than exactly what they are, perfectly designed survival machines. 
Unfortunately, we never reconnected with Patricia. But two days after our departure from the Pontanal, our friend and wildlife photographer, Marlon DeToy, witnessed Patricia finally catching a caiman. Jaguars can sometimes go days without having a meal. It's all about being in the right place at the right time. And when it comes to filming a kill shot, the exact same philosophy applies. What an amazing experience, getting to explore the Brazilian Pantanal for seven straight days, filming its most celebrated apex predator, the Jaguar. Big thanks to Biodiverse Brazil Tours for getting us into the environment, and a big thanks to Abby Martin and the Jaguar ID Project for making us a part of their conservation research. Abby is a light of hope in the world of conservation. Her story and undying commitment to the preservation of these jaguars goes beyond the physical realm and transcends into the spiritual domain. She truly is the mother of jaguars, and her work is worthy of a standing ovation. If you want to learn more or would consider donating to the continued protection and monitoring of this Jaguar population, make sure to visit the Jaguar ID Project. And if you want to embark upon a grand adventure of your own, Biodiverse Brazil Tours will gladly get you into the realm of these iconic cats. 8.52, noise ordinance is enforced at 9 p.m. These kids better quiet down, or they're gonna see Batman get real angry real quick. I think I'll just watch the clock. 8.53, seven minutes until the sign of bites and grub. What's this? A message from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Corey, the other Batman. What? Come to Tennessee? Uh, I don't really have time for this. Fine, let's go. this thing. Old tin can hunk of junk Batmobile. Alfred. Batman? Yeah, it's Batman. Everything okay? And the Batmobile broke down again. Did you update the firmware? No, I did not. Uh, I'm gonna need another option. Oh yeah, Bat Scooter. Open. I said, I said open already. Well, there it goes. Piece of junk tin can Frencheretcha. Old trusty bat scooter. At least it's electric. <sighs> Looks like urgent's gonna have a new meaning. It'd take me all night to get there. I wish Catwoman would return my calls. Cash. Who carries cash these days?
Corey, I got the call. Came as quick as I could. What's the problem? Who do you need Batman to strike vengeance upon? I mean, I'm so glad you finally made it. Mm -hmm. We have an invasive fungus. It's causing disease in bats it's called white nose syndrome. Ooh, that's not good. It affects them while they hibernate. It's killed millions of bats. Uh, that's really bad. What do you need me to do? Well, we really need your help. We need to better understand the fungus and the bats. We need to catch a lot of bats so we can understand their lives better so we know how to protect them. Yeah. You know, Corey, it sounds like my arch nemesis fungi. Uh, the bad news for you is I'm terrified of bats. They haunt my nightmares, these little nocturnal creatures. But the good news is that I know somebody who I'm pretty sure can help. Hey, sound guy, quick, my bath phone. It looks like an iPhone. Don't get cute. This is a high-tech gizmo. Now excuse Batman while he makes a call. Batman, wrong way? Oh. Thanks, Quarry. Peterson, it's Batman. I've got a mission for you. What? Hang up and try again. Uh... What's up, Batman? Peterson, it's Batman again. Bad reception out there, I was in a cave. Listen, I need you to get down to Clarksville, Tennessee, stat. Cl Clarks Clarksville? Yeah, no, Clarksville, that's what I said. Uh, right now, I'm literally about to get a Chaos Emerald in Sonic the Hedgehog. I don't care if you're playing Sonic the Hedgehog, I mean get down to Clarksville now. You're gonna be working with a guy named Corey. Looks like a Viking. He barely calls himself a Batman, but we all know I'm the real Batman. Yeah, you're, we get it, you're the real Batman. So, is this gonna be like last time? I mean, is Alfred gonna wire me money or how do you wanna do this? No, you're not gonna get paid for this adventure. What are you talking about? This is for conservation. The bats need your help. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, fine, I'm just kidding. I don't have to get paid anything. I'll tell you what, I'll go get in the car right now, okay? Well, but what are you gonna do? I'm gonna fight the bad guy, fun guy. <laughs> yeah, you are a fun guy, Batman, aren't you? Yeah, I know I'm a fun guy. No, the bad guy's name is fun guy. Wait, so you're the bad guy? I, I don't understand. I, listen, Peterson, just get down here to Clarksville and do anything Corey tells you. If you don't do a good job, I'm gonna pound you. We gotta save the bats. Batman out. <sighs> yeah, Chaos Emerald. Okay, this looks like it is the GPS point for the turn. It's now time to go off-road and head up to meet Corey and his team. Now, Corey is one of the most renowned bat experts here in the Eastern United States. And when the Batman calls and says, today you're gonna be working with another Batman, he jumps straight into action. Wow, Batman sent Coyote Peterson? I am Coyote Peterson, you must be Corey the other Batman. Yeah, man. Okay, well the one in the cowl said to come down here, find you, and do whatever it is that's necessary. But I have no idea what is it that we're doing. Excellent. So we're here in a cave tonight. We're gonna catch some endangered gray bats. We're gonna apply some transmitters to them. We're generally trying to understand more about their lives so we can conserve and recover them. Okay, well I noticed it's still daylight now, so I feel like I made it the right amount of time. Batman was very specific. He was, Coyote, you better get there before it gets dark or I'm gonna pound you. I said, all right, Batman, calm down a little bit. I'll get there, I'll find Corey. And what do we do until it gets dark? So the bats will start coming out when it's dark. Until then, we've got a bunch of volunteers. You can just make yourself at home and introduce yourself around. Okay, well, let's see if we can uphold our responsibilities to help the bats tonight and make Batman and Batman proud. Let's do it.
Ooh, this is cool. Kind of reminds me of the fence in Jurassic Park 3 when they escape from the Spinosaur. This structure is what encloses in the Bat Cave. And tonight, hundreds of thousands of these little bats are going to pour out of this hole in the ground. And this trap right here, the harp trap, is what is going to catch them. Completely safe for us to be able to get hands on with these little winged mammals. Now, they're gonna flutter up from the hole, bloop, 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 like that, right into this fishing line. Now, when the bats hit it, it's gonna throw them off course and drop them into this trough. So there will be multiple people who are properly permitted to be able to handle these bats. We're gonna get them in bags. They're gonna get passed out of the enclosure and then up to the table where we will analyze them, pull some biometrics, and with some of them, place little tiny transmitters so that Corey and his team can follow the migration pattern of these nocturnal winged creatures. Right now, I am playing the role of Bat Boy, which means that I am waiting for bats to come up from the trap. I was told there's gonna be about 20 bats in this next hall, and they're gonna be in a box, perhaps. I'm gonna have to quickly but gently move them up the hill, get them up to the hooks, and then to Corey to find out whether or not these are ones that are gonna get transmitters put on them. Waiting for the right one. I feel like I'm gonna see it. I'm gonna know it when it's the right bat. All right, I think I see the one that I wanna take back to Corey. We got a jumbo right here. All right, is this going to be the bat that we place a transmitter on? We're about to find out. All right, Corey, hey, awesome. we got a super fighter here. I've endearingly named it Fuzzy Butt, and this one just really wants to get out of the bag, and it seems big. I'm pretty sure it's an uh, adult. It looks like a healthy bat to mm -hmm. me. Yeah, let's have a look. Oh, Seems yeah. heavy. About 12 grams. 12 grams, including okay. Including the bag, and the bag is 2.3. So that's plenty big enough for us to put a transmitter on, and is very likely to be an adult. And you can see all the sort of finger bones. It's mm -hmm. just like the fingers in our hands. Right, so for yeah. everybody out there watching to understand who know nothing about bats, their wings are actually like their hands, as that's compared right. to like a bird's wings. Yeah, yeah. They're in the order Chiroptera, and that means Hand wing. Hand wing. Yep, yep, and they're mammals. People kind of think of them as flying mice or rodents, but they're actually much more closely related to primates than us. Wow. Looks like a male. It's a male, okay. Yeah, we're checking nice. that uh, corner to sort of knuckle to see if the bone is fused or not. Okay. And tells us if it's uh, an adult or a juvenile. And so it is fused. This is fused, okay. it's an adult. A very healthy looking gray bat. Let's go ahead and get that forearm measurement. Okay. You wanna grab those calipers? Yeah. Oh man, he is really, can't bite through your glove? No. He's really going for it. Yeah, he's giving it a shot. All right, let's okay. see, what do we think? We are at 44 millimeters. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah fuzzy butt Oh, healthy. I picked a good one. Yeah, you did, you did. All right, so. These bats can carry rabies, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Just like a lot of other mammals, bats are actually really, really interesting. So things with bones, vertebrates like us, mm -hmm. that fly are really rare on Earth. Yeah. You know, it's only happened three times. Pterosaurs, birds, and bats. And to do that, they have to have some really sort of specialized internal systems. And one of those is sort of cellular recovery because they're flapping their wings so fast and so hard, they're burning a lot of cells and they're damaging a lot of tissue and they repair that really, really fast. Hmm. But that also sort of creates a scenario where if they have viruses, the viruses have to become super strong mm. to live inside the bat. Okay, because so. the bats are so healthy and robust. And that is why it impacts other animals like humans. Okay. Um, so we're gonna take our transmitter. Okay. And- You want me to apply a little bit of glue yeah, under there? If you would flip that over yep. so the flat side is facing up. And then... Is it hard for you to focus with all of this chattering coming out of Fuzzy Butt right now? No, I'm pretty used to it. I mean, this bat has so much to say. It's unbelievable how loud this is in my ear. The high-pitched nature of that little squeak is impressive. 
Boy, I bet if Batman's watching this episode, he's gonna be super proud of the work that we're doing here. And so it's clear for the past 20 years, you've been doing research on these bats with the Nature Conservancy. That's right. And the goal in the end for having these transmitters on the bats, and the transmitters will eventually fall out, the yep. goal is to find what information? So we're trying to understand what type of habitat they're using in the summertime, what their foraging range is, how mm -hmm. far are they going from this cave, what type of habitat are they using, are they generally over waterways, are they you know, over farm fields, things of that nature. So we understand what sort of habitat to protect for this bat moving forward. Got it. So there's no guarantee that when these bats leave this cave that they're coming back to this cave every night. They could go into a different cave or That's roost right. elsewhere. Yeah, this is our second year doing this particular project mm -hmm. at this site. And last year we did have bats that the night after we put transmitters on, they flew to another cave 50 miles away hmm. and were detected there for multiple days. Uh, so these bats move around the landscape quite a bit and we don't really have a good understanding of what they're doing and where they're going. And ultimately this research will help you determine maybe why they're moving from spot to spot. That's right. Okay. So you love bats. I do. The Nature Conservancy loves bats, yep. wants to conserve them. Why should people love bats? You know, bats are really, really fascinating on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. Sort of the, the textbook answer is they're really, really incredible insect eaters things that are generally considered crop pests mm -hmm. and uh, impact our agricultural chain. Um, you know, here in Tennessee, there have been estimates of, you know, millions and millions of dollars that bats are saving the agricultural industry. And in the United States wide, it's billions of dollars. Okay. Yeah. So bats are big money savers at the end of the day. Big time. I feel like bats have a little bit of a bad reputation because, you know, throughout the course of history, bats have been associated with things like vampires. Get yeah. bitten by a bat, you might turn into a vampire. Or that you might get rabies. But as it turns out, bats are really doing quite a bit of good for the entire food cycle that we rely on as humans. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. that, that's good to know. So the protection that you're doing, the protection the Nature Conservancy is doing to ensure that the future of bats is protected is really pretty important. Yep, yep. It's what we consider sort of a landscape service mm -hmm. for humans. Very cool. Yeah, there are these small little animals. We don't know much about them. I think people have that fear. They fall into the creepy and crawly yep. because they live a very different lifestyle than we do. They're nocturnal, and they're just very different. Well, you know, this is an episode that we're gonna put out around Halloween time. And okay. the reason for that is because people tune into things around Halloween time because of the creepy crawly nature. But yeah. anytime we can dispel some of the myths and rumors surrounding things that people are afraid of, it's better for the animals in the long run. Yeah, yeah. And bats are just fascinating animals. I mean, everything we're learning from this project is new information that nobody knew before. So, so we're gonna go ahead and stick this transmitter on. Adhering the transmitter. Yeah, and we're just gonna hold that transmitter for a few minutes. Now in the grand scheme of feisty bats, where does Fuzzy Butt rank on the loudest and most rambunctious? Fuzzy Butt is up there. Okay. Yeah, so for gray bats especially, they tend to be kind of calm and chill. And Fuzzy Butt is not chill. This is the angriest bat in the entire cave. I, it probably is. Out of the 300,000, we picked the one with the I, most attitude. I think you did. He's Can guessing. you understand bat chirps and squeaks and whatnot? I'm afraid not. Yeah, our ears just can't not. pick that up, That's right? That's right. That's right, I'm not attuned. But they are very vocal mm -hmm. and they're very social and we know that they communicate with each other and they communicate a lot of information vocally bat to bat. I'll tell you what, when I get on the phone tomorrow with Batman, I'm gonna report back that Fuzzy Butt certainly had a lot to say. He's off somewhere fighting uh, some, something named Fungi, some bad guy uh, named Fungi. Yeah. You know anything about this? I do. What's, what's this Fungi thing that I keep it's hearing about? It's bad, so it's this fungus that's affecting cave hibernating bats. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's a real thing. It's not this is just some Fungi that likes to cause trouble, it's a fungus? It's a real thing. Clearly I misunderstood that. All right, so yeah. what's happening with the fungus and the bats? So there's an invasive fungus that is affecting bats while they're hibernating in caves. Okay. And it causes them to use up their energy stores faster than they would normally. Oh, wow. Yeah, so bats normally have about two or so grams of fat to get them through the winter, and it's not very much. And the fungus just causes them to sort of wake up and use more energy than they would normally. And millions of bats have died from this fungus. Wow, what is the fungus called? So it causes a disease known as white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome. Okay, Batman's mission right now is to actually go and fight fungi and hopefully bring this to an end. Do you think that's possible? I'm glad to hear he's on the case. Yeah, I mean, I was told he was on the case. I guess we're yeah. gonna have to wait till the end of this episode to find out whether or not he actually concludes his mission. Okay. So how do you think he's doing with his glued on transmitter? I think he's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's time to let this guy fly we're free. 
pull the decals oh, off. Okay. Stick it on the data sheet. Okay. Make sure it's on the line. So I think Fuzzy Butt's ready to go. Yeah, he's just gonna keep biting your fingers if you don't let him go. Would you like to let Fuzzy Butt go? I would love to. If I put on the glove, you think, eh, not without gloves, huh? Just do it. These are some pretty durable gloves, so I think I'm gonna be okay. Wearing a glove and vaccinated against rabies? Yeah, I'm in good shape. I think you can do it. All right, Fuzzy Butt. This is the big moment I've been waiting for. For you back into the wild. So you just kind of hold that tail membrane. Mm -hmm. Very, very him, gently. Got okay. him, okay. And then hold him up high. Oh, wow, chomp it right into my finger. All yeah. right, you guys got a good shot there on Fuzzy Butt. Fly free, my friend. Hold him up a little higher. There you go. There goes Fuzzy Butt. There goes Fuzzy Butt. Awesome. And we didn't get attacked. No. How about that? <laughs> Woo, well, Corey, that was awesome. Getting the chance to come out here, help you and the Nature Conservancy with your research. And now we'll be able to figure out where these bats are going and what I they're hope doing. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, stay tuned, guys. I have a feeling we're going to have a little update from Batman. We're going to find out whether or not he meets up with Fun Guy and whether or not <clears throat> he can win the battle. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. Corey, that was Thank awesome. Thank you, Coyote. Where are you, fun guy? I know you're here somewhere. I can smell you. Yeah, it's burning my nose. Because... There you are. Oh, ah. uh, oh, oh, that white nose packs a punch. Uh, uh, all right, white nose. I got you right where I want you now. Bats are gross. They drink blood. Whoa, we don't say that. It's a misconception. Most of us oh. eat fruit oh. and insects. You're blind as a bat. You can't even hear me. Yeah, right. We use echolocation. Take this. Oh, oh. echolocate this. Oh, right, my bat <laughs> buttons. Oh. Look at our bats anyways. They just get stuck in people's hair. Wrong again. Bats serve an important role in ecosystems worldwide, just like the ones Corey's trying to protect. No! Ah! Mm -hmm. You're finished, White Nose Syndrome. Mission accomplished. He forgot to latch me in. <laughs> That's right. You're gonna need better conservation efforts to protect your precious bats. <laughs> hey, bats need better conservation. Somebody needs to help Corey and Peterson. Clearly, bats are gonna go extinct if we don't do something, but Batman can't save everyone. Jeez. Ugh, the fight against white nose syndrome is ongoing. But with frontline warriors like Corey leading the battle, hope is on the horizon. And for those who are now big fans of Fuzzy Butt, we're excited to let you know that this individual was very active during the course of his tracking, and on a nightly basis would travel like up to 50 miles to hunt for food. It's crazy. The coolest part is that he would always return to this same location to roost. Cave Sweet Cave. A big thanks to Nature Conservancy for allowing me specifically to be a part of this research. And if you'd like to get involved or I don't know, follow along with any of their other projects, make sure to check out their website. As for me, Batman, enjoy these deleted scenes as I continue to strike vengeance upon someone, somewhere, for some reason. Okay, Batman out. We can't make a Bat slash Batman episode without talking about Batman. Uh -huh. Do you have a favorite Batman throughout the years? And there's many, and the animated series also counts. I'm gonna have to go with Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton? For me, okay. that's Batman. Oh, my shoe's untied, hold on a second. What about this Batman? Mm, nah. Think smart before you answer, Corey, and don't get cute. Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton? That's it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Almost killed us. <laughs>
Look at her bats anyways, they just get into people's hair. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. <laughs> I can't see you, sorry. <laughs> oh, I punched me right in the nose. Ow! I can't see in this. Oh. All right, well, that might conclude the punches. We got oh. one good one. Oh, dude, I'm sorry. You're okay, because he didn't break my teeth. Ow! What just happened, Batman? <laughs> oh, is my nose bleeding or no? That's good, I got a pretty strong nose. He just clocked me right in the face. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> oh, woo, all right, well, <laughs> I'm sure it happens to Batman in real life. All right, back to scene. I have no depth Ow. perception. <laughs> I can't see. We were way too close to you. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> All right, you got me square right in the nose. Woo! Oh, man.